Well, fabulous. And thank you, Jessica. I am uh, very excited about being with everybody tonight. And as Jessica said, I'm Pam Gothart, and I'm the Professional Learning Coordinator for uh, Social Studies School Service and Nystrom Education. So thank you all so much for being with us. I'm really excited about the topic tonight. I'm uh, very big on assessment. I think that assessments are a, a major uh, component that we use not only as teachers, but as administrators and leaders in the field of social studies. Now we could debate the idea whether or not grades are a good idea, but I do think assessments are a good idea. So let's get started. If we can, uh, sometimes when I move that over, it doesn't start right away. Let me get that going. Okay. So our agenda for this afternoon is we're going to talk a little bit about what assessments are and why we use them. We're going to look at both formative and summative assessments. And then we're also going to do just a little bit on uh, the difference between traditional versus authentic assessments. And then I want to kind of wind down the webinar with really talking about the C3 framework particularly looking at dimension four, where it talks about communicating results and taking informed action. I'd really like you guys to be participatory tonight. So if you would, in your chat section there, I'd love to know like, what, what are some things that you came to the session wanting to know about tonight for, for assessments? Uh, we had way more than a full slate of people register for tonight. I've got a lot of people that uh, weren't able to get in. So it's a hot topic, but why? Why is assessment uh, a hot topic? What is it that you had in mind for tonight? Or uh, are there any particular questions or thoughts that you have going into our session for this evening? Using that chat feature on uh, the right-hand side of your screen there, I'd love to hear some of your questions or thoughts. Oh, okay, good question. Um, okay, we got some good things here, looking at the difference between uh, using traditional tests, using something more alternative or authentic. And then has anyone chosen the power standards from the D4 and the C3? That's a great question. And Eric, I'd love to hear what you're doing with the C3 there with, uh, with your school. Let's see, we're gonna go ahead and start into this, but please go ahead and keep posting. Uh, I'd love to hear from you and see what you're thinking about assessments as well. So I'm gonna start with kind of like, what are assessments and why are we really talking about these tonight? And I, I want to differentiate between assessments and grades. Grades are another topic altogether. I really like to look at assessments and assessments are measures. They're ways that we, look at uh, students learning and measure somehow what that learning has accomplished or to what degree students have learned have learned something. Assessments to me are evidence of student learning. It's the, it's the proof that students have learned something. And I put it like this. So what if you went to your physician or a surgeon and your surgeon uh, has never had to prove to anyone that they really know how to conduct a surgery. Would you be okay with that? And I'm thinking I would not be okay with that. Like I want my surgeon to have proved to someone either through some type of authentic assessment, maybe where they're doing a surgery with someone right there, as well as some type of pen and paper assessment to, uh, to indicate to me that, yeah, they know how to do surgery. So I would want something some type of assessment there. So if I want some type of assessment, I'm going to start with formative assessments. And formative assessments should drive your teaching. And, and they're not where you start. You start with that uh, backward design model of starting with where is it you want students to get to. And I want to get them over here to this big circle down here on my uh, line at the bottom. I want to get them to this big circle. That's going to be my summative assessment. But to get them to that summative assessment, I have several formative assessments that I want to do along the way that's going to help me 
gauge whether or not they're getting it. We say that as teachers, did they get it? Did they understand or comprehend what the study was for that particular lesson or unit? And uh, so that's where I'm gonna start with tonight is our formative assessments. And the formative assessments drive our teaching because they drive whether or not we move forward or whether we need to back up and reteach something. And I'll say this, all summative assessments can be formative, but not all formative ass assessments can be summative. And what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's a true statement that summative assessments can also be formative? What do you think? Okay. Got a yes. Anybody else want to chime in? What do you think? Can summative assessments also be formative? Good, good. Thanks for the answers. I appreciate that, you guys. Thanks so much. So I'm going to start with just going over a few um, a few types of formative assessments. And these are things that are kind of common, I'm, I'm going to say K-12 because tonight's webinar really is K-12, but I'm going to say these are just some of the ones that we can look at. Close reading activities. Sometimes it's monitoring students, it's walking around the room, it's listening to what they're saying, watching what they're doing. Those are formative assessments and those are the things you do so many times in a day. Quick writes, quizzes. Not my favorite, but I threw it up on the list. Quizzes, I don't personally like them, but you know, we're all different. Hand gestures, and I mean that in the nicest of ways. I don't mean anything ugly, but like a thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, did they get it? Uh, exit slips, these are all types of formative assessments. And so if we break these down a little bit and look at a close reading strategy, for instance. A close reading strategy requires students to read a text with some type of purpose. Now that I'm going to tell you, I love. I love that students read with a purpose. I think it really helps on so many fronts. So a purpose for a close reading activity might be to strengthen their understanding of complex text. Or uh, for me, it just provides a purpose for their reading, which inadvertently also strengthens their understanding for the reading of complex text. It measures comprehension, and I'm sure it measures other things too. So these aren't just like, you know, all answers, but they're just some kind of short tidbits of answers. What are the benefits of close reading strategies? Uh, they strengthen students' reading skills, and they're immediate. If you guys use Active Classroom, which I absolutely love, one of my favorite reading activities in Active Classroom is called Power Basics. And there are short chunks of reading, always followed by either multiple choice or true false or some kind of little quick assessment that just says, hey, I got this. Yes, I can answer these questions. Uh, I like that because it's so immediate. The deficits of using a close reading strategy is that for one thing, it can be time consuming because we're asking the students to actually slow down and read for comprehension. We're not reading for fluency today. Uh, so that's, can be a deficit, it's also positive. And sometimes they're not easy to grade. You know, there are some things we do with a close reading where they circle this, underline that, question marks here, you know, we're having them use all these different things within a text. Sometimes that can get a little murky if we're actually trying to put a grade on it. So benefits and deficits to uh, close reading strategies. I'm personally, I'm a fan of them. Quick writes, and I saw somebody post and said, oh, I love quick writes. Me too, I love it. I love when kids have an opportunity to write a quick response to uh, a question that kind of sums up the day's activities. Uh, I think that they're purposeful and that they give students a good opportunity, one, to practice their writing skills, uh, putting down on paper what they're thinking, and two, again, it's that comprehension of content. What did they actually learn today about the Spanish American War? Jot it down and they're giving you that little quick write. It, it measures their thinking. So it doesn't always measure understanding, but it certainly measures their thinking about something. And um, it's nice because it can be quick. It can be a mini assessment that's leading towards that summative assessment, 
maybe at the end of a segment, they're going to write like a five paragraph DBQ. And if they're using these quick writes along the way, then that's helping to prepare them and get them ready for, uh, for that DBQ. The deficit uh, for the quick write is sometimes it can be a little more time consuming to grade. I mean, you know, let's just face it, if we're a high school teacher and I'm out there, my, my classes, I used to have around 30 to a class. And I had three of them a day and 90 students to grade. So every night if I went home with a quick write, you know, that's going to take some time. But it's, uh, it's a balance between what works for your students, what helps them to really be productive and, and efficient and get out of learning what they need. Another one that I really like is exit slips. Uh, some type of way of summarizing the main points from the day. It might be like, okay, today we, um, so the Spanish American War, give me four things that you learned today. Well, sometimes, and this is just my own personal experience, I've seen teachers use exit slips more as an accountability feature rather than an academic. Sometimes they do it just to say like, hey, I collected these at the end of the day, everybody turned it in, everybody gets some kind of, you know, nominal grade for having done something. I'm not a fan of that, but again, you know, we're all different. We all come from different aspects of that K-12 spectrum. Uh, they're also purposeful. They help students to determine what the big ideas of the day were. You know, it's kind of like you can't have students take notes on things when they don't really understand what the big ideas are. They have to learn those things. So the exit slip can be a way to get students to hone those skills a little bit, to stifle, stifle, not stifle, <laughs> not stifle anybody, but to kind of uh, sift through all that we've done in a day and come up with those things that really were the, the takeaways. It measures the rate at which students are able to uh, recognize the big ideas and it helps to determine their ability to uh, determine what those important ideas of the day are. Typically, they're quick to grade uh, or easy to review if you're not grading them. Of course, the deficit is that they are going to lack depth of understanding. Thumbs up, thumbs down, and thumbs sideways. Okay, I have to be totally honest here. I use these in my trainings a lot of the time. And I'm, as I was writing this, I got to thinking, maybe I shouldn't use that anymore because it really doesn't tell you a lot. But I would say to, to teachers, you know, we're in here and we're learning about active classroom. Uh, how do you feel about being able to assign an activity to your students? Do you feel like you can do that? Give me a thumbs up. If you can't, give me a thumbs down. And if you're not sure, give me a thumb sideways. You know, that really doesn't tell me what they know. It tells me what they think they know. So I started rethinking this when I'm like, oh, I'm kind of thinking now, I don't know if I should do that. What do you guys think? Do you like thumbs up, thumbs down? Or is that kind of one that just really maybe doesn't measure enough for us to even use? What do you think? Is it worth using or not? What do you think? I'm seeing some posts. Uh, oh, Jennifer, you don't like it either, really. Okay. Uh, Jessica, do we have any other posts that we need to take a look at at the moment? Because I've, I've seen quite a few coming through. Sorry, I need to un unmute myself as well. Um, <laughs> no problem. Uh, like it don't like it we're getting some on this for the thumbs up thumbs down but i know there's been a lot of posts in there jessica could you just take a look and see if i need to answer anything um i cannot eric asked if we could see him uh we cannot see you right now we should just be able to see the chat feature mm -hmm. um he also mentions that world history project a uh, big history project creation of digital portfolios has been helpful Oh, I love portfolios. Good one. Yes. Exit slips. Let's see. Um, oh, look at this. I like what Brittany just said. Oh, you have them do a thumbs up, thumbs down, but you have them do it where it's not real visible to everybody. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like so that. Let me know if there's anything that we need to um, answer or or whatever as we go along. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right now. I, I think we're good. I don't. I don't. We're see good. Anything. Good. Mm -hmm. 
So in terms of using our formative assessment, I would like to say this, as a former um, social studies supervisor, going out and watching teachers, I would watch teachers use formative assessment multiple, multiple times in a day. The thing was, at the end of the day, I'd say, so what, what are you doing with all the formative assessment information you gathered today? And I would get like these blank stares. And it's like, okay, we, we've we all been taught to use formative assessment, but it's what you do with it that really matters. So if we're gathering it and collecting it and we're storing it in buckets and we get done at the end of the day and we don't do anything with it, it was a little pointless for us to do all the formative assessments. The formative assessments are really the things that help us know if we need to reteach something or move on. And sometimes with social studies, that can be tricky because sometimes we're working on skills that take a long time to develop, but it can at least be a guide for us and help us along the way. So as we think about formative, we're also gonna move in then to summative assessments. Now, summative assessments can be formative, but not all formative can be summative. For instance, we've studied a unit on um, states and we've finished the unit maybe on uh, the state of Maine, and we do some type of formative assess, uh, uh, excuse me, summative assessment. Maybe it's that fourth grade notebook that we're all familiar with that has all the stuff glued into it, and we've made comments on it, and that's our summative assessment. Couldn't that also be a formative assessment of what a student might be doing in a bigger picture of now moving from state history to US history? Uh, I think we can think about summative assessments that way. Although I do believe that we have to have some type of summative assessment, some way that kind of wraps up a unit of study, a chapter, a topic, a theme, that kind of at least ties it together and says, okay, we've kind of talked about this, done this, and now we've assessed it. Not that we're going to leave it and not ever touch it again, but that we're gonna at least kind of move on from that point. Some of these assessments are culminating activities. A variety of culminating activities can be used. It can be an end of the chapter test or an end of unit test. Project-based assessment. I love project-based, performance-based and product-based assessment. I like things that are more authentic in nature. Uh, again, I'm telling you a lot of what I like. It is completely up to you guys what you guys like. We're all different. Uh, Document-based questions. I love using document-based questions. Uh, Open-ended questions. Standardized testing. Uh-oh, I said that dirty word. Standardized testing. Standardized testing is a form of summative assessment, oftentimes administered by our state departments, uh, sometimes by our school districts individually, but primarily by state departments. And typically, we don't think of standardized testing as a form of sub summative assessment. We think of it as just that one big test that we've all got to get through in order to be able to get back to teaching in our classrooms. But it really is a, a summative assessment of what students have learned up to that point, whether it's some reading or math or uh, some type of critical thinking or whatever it is we're using. So summative assessments can be in a variety of uh, formats. For a unit or a chapter test, we use those a lot to measure students' learning of a particular set of content or skills. They're typically speaking easy to grade, and they do reflect students' learning. And uh, in terms of limitations, sometimes they're limited to the scope of the content and skills that are actually tested, and they're not always rigorous. Sometimes they have portions that are rigorous, but in general, a unit test or a chapter test in and of itself is not a rigorous document. Portions of it are. Um, Project-based uh, project assessments uh, tend to be more real world based or real problem based. Again, you run project, problem, performance, product, all of those kind of collectively could be in there together but they are in some way a way that students apply what they've learned to a real world situation, uh, whatever that might be. The benefits are it's very in depth, typically rigorous. The other side of that is they're limiting in that they're time consuming to grade, 
And sometimes they're very time consuming to plan. So trade-offs, we always have trade-offs, right? But project-based, and we're gonna say in that one, performance-based, product-based, problem-based, all of those. If any of you are active classroom users, this is where we think about zombie-based geography or the historian's apprentice or document, uh, debating the documents. In fact, one of my favorite activities in uh, Active Classroom is based on uh, DBQs. It's called Debating the Documents. I love it. DBQs are designed to have some type of culminating question that's at the end of students reviewing some primary sources. And the number of primary sources can differ, but it's some collection of primary sources. Typically they're rigorous and typically it gives you a good level of understanding as to what the students really know. The, the downside to that would be, again, takes time to grade. Um, again, looking at trade-offs between all of these different types of assessment. And then we get into traditional versus authentic or alternative. Traditional refers typically to pen and paper like Typical tests we think of, standardized tests, unit tests, chapter tests. Typically, they are multiple choice items, vocabulary items. Generally, they do have uh, a mix of other questions with them uh, that range in critical thinking questions to open-ended questions. And then authentic or alternative assessments typically refer to those things that are more real-world design, project based, uh, problem based, DBQ type questions range in that more authentic area of uh, assessments. And then that kind of leads us up to the C3 framework. I want, I want you guys to tell me just, you know, we're all on here together. It doesn't matter who does and who doesn't, but tell me if you know about the C3 framework. Like, do you know what it is, where it came from? and do you use it in your classroom? Just give me a yes or a no even, that'll be great. Let me just see what you guys think. Do you know about the C3 framework? Okay, okay. Let's see, what else? Do you know about it? Do you know where it comes from? Do you know how to use it? Okay, definitely got some mixed reactions here. Okay, good to know, good to know. So this comes from the National Council for Social Studies. Uh, it's from ncss.org. I have the website on there just so you guys can look at it later if you'd like. Uh, but there are four dimensions to the C3 framework. And if you look at the different dimensions of the framework, what you're actually doing is not only are you uh, conducting the teaching in these, but you're also giving opportunity for formative assessment as you work up to dimension four, where you have your kind of culminating activities and your um, summative assessment. So let's take a look at dimension one. Dimension one is all about developing questions and planning inquiries. And the C3 framework is about having an inquiry and students being uh, involved in the inquiry to get to uh, that opportunity to deliver some type of uh, summative evaluation. Uh, so I put some examples up here for you. Dimension one is about developing questions, particularly compelling questions. So I pulled uh, from our second grade uh, program, Young Citizens, and one of the questions is, what does it take to make a state? From fifth grade, I looked at uh, how did the English colonies grow? And you notice in both of those, the teacher is asking the questions. I like then though how I shifted in middle school and world in, uh, in high school and put it on the student to ask the questions. And we can do this either way at any of the grade levels. For middle school, I pulled from uh, one of our curriculum maps that I believe Jana Kirchner wrote this one, I'm not sure exactly. But said you'd have students brain brainstorm the meaning of revolution. What does it take to be a revolution? And then explain to the students that they're gonna be studying about scientific ideas and political revolutions and have them work with a partner to develop questions they want to know about revolutions. And then the idea would be to hang these around the room and these are gonna be your guiding questions then throughout your study that you're doing here on the scientific revolution the Enlightenment and the political revolutions of the period. 
for high school U.S. history. Uh, we're using an atlas of U.S. history on the Spanish-American War, and it says, using the Overseas Empire map, write down what you notice and wonder about the map. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take those things that you wonder about the map, and you're going to make them into more compelling questions. And again, hang those around the room. The students are more invested. They've written the questions that they want to learn about during your study of the Spanish-American War. So this is to mention one of your C3 framework where you or the students are asking questions, are designing the inquiry that you want to learn about. Uh, dimension two of the C3 framework, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on dimension two or three, but dimension two is about applying your disciplinary tools. And here you can see like one of the standards here says, create and use a chronological sequence of related events to compare developments that happened at the same time. I'm thinking a timeline would be a great use here. You could use uh, a timeline where maybe even the students uh, draw images for the different periods and things that are going on. But uh, dimension two of your C3 framework is about applying the disciplinary tools and concepts of history, geography, economics, and civics. We're applying all of those lens to what we're studying in the social studies. And dimension three is now looking at those sources, both primary and secondary, and evaluating sources, uh, judging the sources on their credibility and, and their usefulness and going through as students, collecting the information from multiple sources and using that information to help make uh, judgments and uh, analysis about what it is they're studying. So you can see dimension one, two, and three, students are doing, students are setting the inquiry, students are using the different lens of the social studies, and students are evaluating the sources and using evidence to, to get to the summative assessment. So all of these are formative to this point. And then they get to, to dimension four of the C3 framework where we're really talking about having students communicate their conclusions or take informed action. And I love this idea of informed action because we don't want them to just take action. We want them to take informed action. What does that mean? What does it look like? Well, it, it means maybe constructing arguments with reason. Wow, who would have thought of that one, right? We want students to actually construct an argument using reason or using um, evidence from what they've learned. Here we're uh, constructing explanations, whether it's at the grade two level, and if I didn't, I didn't really say it earlier, these are from the C3 framework, and these are your dimension four standards. So this is for K2 students, three through five students, six, eight, and nine, 12. That's our grade bands uh, with using the C3. But they're constructing explanations. Think about in what form of summative assessment could your students best construct an explanation? Or how could they best summarize an argument, defend a position? How could they best do that? What manner of summative assessment might you do to let them express that learning through uh, defending a position? And then it's about critiquing arguments critiquing explanations, explaining problems, and taking or working towards some type of solution. Draw a disciplinary concept to, drawing on disciplinary concepts to explain the challenges people have faced and opportunities they've created in addressing local, regional, and global problems at various times. Wow, that's like today, we're all, we're all quarantined, right? So that's like, what could they do? How could they address this? Uh, they're looking at real world problems and working towards solutions and taking action. How do students take action? Well, maybe one way they take action is maybe they write the head of their emergency management agency in your state and give them suggestions from a fifth grader on how to deal with our uh, COVID-19. Or maybe it's even not only the classroom, but even beyond the classroom. Uh, they could also do things like presentations in class. 
doing these uh, summatives by the C3 framework does not mean that every unit, every um, chapter has to end in some type of big thing of going outside the classroom to your legislators. But it does mean that students need to have a variety of ways through which they communicate their learning to you. Whether it's writing, whether it's in a presentation they stand up and deliver in class or a project they put on a project board, they need opportunities or ways to give to you that evidence, that proof of their learning in a summative format. And uh, here are just a couple of examples of the D4 that I put up for you. This is from a second grade project out of Young Citizens. And each uh, chapter in Young Citizens ends with a chapter test and a chapter project. You can do one or both. This one is uh, having to make movie posters. Uh, and you can see here a little bit about that. But this is another way that students can communicate their learning. And another way is this is from uh, a high school assessment, document-based assessment of US history, uh, the debate over American imperialism, and the students are going to be answering a DBQ. So they're gonna be answering in a five paragraph uh, response. But however we want to have those summative assessments delivered, we need to provide uh, opportunity for students to deliver that through a variety of methods. And if we're using a traditional test, be sure that we're including something on it that is open-ended or ways for students to express their critical thinking about what it is they've learned. So assessments. Assessments provide for us the evidence that student learning has occurred. They're helping us determine if we reached our goal with our students. Formative assessments help us to connect the dots along the way to make sure that when students get to the summative assessment, they're successful. Let me say this, you shouldn't give a summative assessment and then get grades that surprise you. If the grades on the summative assessment surprise you at how low they are, something was amiss during the formative assessments along the way. I used to have a, a colleague and she would just teach her heart out. I mean, she would come in the workroom all the time talking about, I did this with my student state and I did that with my student state. And she was like a little fireball. And then as I got into another position and started observing her, I was like, oh my gosh, like she teaches her heart out. But she never stopped to measure whether or not students were getting what she was giving. And it was always her giving. It wasn't them like inquiry design and getting it for themselves. She was giving it, but she never measured whether or not they were getting it till the final assessment. And then she'd be like, you know, I've taught this for three weeks and I don't understand. My kids didn't understand it. They didn't get any of it. I'm thinking, oh, I now can tell you why they're not getting it. You didn't do anything in the formative assessments to ensure that they were getting where you needed them to get to. So there shouldn't be a disconnect. When you get to summative, the responses you get out of your students should not be surprising because we should already know along the way how they're doing. And if they're not doing well, we should be backing up and, and reteaching or uh, giving more opportunity for practice along the way. Summative assessment just gives us a way to tie up that uh, learning that has occurred during a unit, chapter, project of study. I would love to talk to you guys more about assessment. So please take a few moments, give me a question. Um, give me a question, post something here for us. Uh, I'd love to share with you and hear from you what you guys know, want to know, want to share about assessments, whatever that is, whether it's formative or summative or uh, traditional or authentic, feel free to share that. I'm going to take a look at some of the things you guys have been posting. Ah, Eric, thank you. Look at that. Eric has shared his contact information with us. Uh, please feel free to reach out to Eric. Eric is in uh, an international school there in South Korea. Great, wouldn't that be great to connect your students to his students? Um, lovely. Okay. Looks like a lot of comments on the C3, good. Uh, as, you, 
exit today, please take a couple of seconds to complete that uh, short uh, evaluation for us. Okay, anybody else? Oh, uh, looks like I got some really nice comments in here. I love that uh, Daria, I may not pronounce that correctly, but Daria said that uh, using so much assessments with writing, always big. I love that. Yeah. You know, I like to have kids really talk about things too before I get them to write. I feel like if they talk about it, then they're usually able to write about it a little bit better too. Okay. If you have anything else you'd like to share, please do post it. Uh, we do save our chat post. And if there's anything in there that you guys uh, had questions about that I missed, I'll go back over that and make sure that I email you uh, today or tomorrow with some kind of response to that. Other than that, 